invitation from heaven. The Lamb is worthy, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to chapter 5, verse 14. We are now presented with what can only be described as a magnificent picture of the courts of heaven that are continually filled with praise and worship to God, to which words cannot do justice or an artist's brush capture. These chapters set the mood for the rest of the book, which is the victory of Christ over Satan and his forces and the eternal rest of the believer. John now begins to write about those second things that Christ commanded him to write in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, the things that will take place. Section 8, the throne of God, chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Verse 1, Winston Churchill arranged his own funeral. There was a stately hymns in St. Paul's Cathedral and an impressive liturgy. But at the end of the service, Churchill had an unusual event planned. When they said the benediction, a bugler high in the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral on one side played taps, the universal signal that the day was over. And after a long pause, another bugler on the other side played Ravalli, the military wake-up call. Christ has something unusually planned here for his believers. Chapter 3 draws to a close with Christ standing at the door of the heart of the believer. And John hears the voice of God break through the silence, sounding like a powerful, domineering, overpowering blast of a bugler's wake-up call. John's attention is immediately drawn heavenward uh, to the direction of the sound, and there he sees a door of heaven open wide. Jesus then commands him to come up into heaven because he wants to show John the things uh, which must take place. And the word must is important in the Greek, it's the word di, and in the context it indicates divine necessity. It shows us that John saw and recorded were just not things that absorbed his own interest, but they are things that, that are completely in the divine will of God. No event recorded in the book of Revelation happened by chance. They are all part of God's divine will and plan. Verses 2 to 3. Immediately John hears a voice and a command and he's transported to heaven and finds himself standing before the throne of God. John says, I was in the spirit. The repetition of the phrase, Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, suggests that there is a short period of time between John uh, sees about the seven churches as recorded in chapters 1 to 3, which allows him to return to a normal state of human existence. This second experience, like the first, elevates him to a spiritually higher plane in which all the connections with this world, as we know it, are lost to him, and he is entirely under the divine influence of the Holy Spirit. The phrase come up here in verse 1, uh, with the phrase, I was in the Spirit, clearly indicates that there's no effort on John's part to enter heaven. It was from this newly uh, spiritual elevated experience and vantage point of heaven that John records the events that comprise the book of Revelation. To John's startled and amazed eyes, he finds himself before the glorious throne of God and the one who sits upon it, uh, God himself. John says, Behold a throne set in heaven. And the word behold in the Greek here means to refer to something that suddenly catches one's whole attention with the emphasis on both seeing and listening to what is before you. By this word, John draws us into his experience so that we become part of what's being revealed. The first thing that John does is to assure the believer that God is in total control of the events that have and will take place. For he tells us that God is seated upon his throne. The word sat in verse 2 describes the position of a king or person in authority. In democratic countries, when elections are held uh, for various regions of governments, uh, the elected members of parliament, upon taking up office, are said to be seated in parliament, and the losers are said to be unseated from office. When a member of parliament takes up office, uh, they are said to be seated. It means that they are actively exercising their executive role in the best interest of those who elected them. John, by stating that God is seated upon his throne, is first assuring us that no power of darkness or evil can overthrow him. He is sovereign over all, and secondly, God is actively exercising his executive roles in the church's best interest. John sets out to describe what he sees. We know that no one can see God and live, so what John describes in these verses 
is more the divine attributes and character of God. Firstly, he says that God is like a jasper stone. A jasper stone in antiquity is not the same stone we know today. The jasper stone we know today is striped and speckled colors, while in, in antiquity it was a crystal-like translucent gem and was another name for a diamond. The clearness of the stone represents God's purity and the brilliance of his holiness. Secondly, John says that God is like a sardis stone in appearance. This stone is blood red in coloring and portrays God's justice and redemptive work of love and grace to restore us through Christ becoming our propitiation to a loving relationship with him. John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, that he, Jesus himself, is the propitiation of our sins. The word propitiation basically means wrath-removing sacrifice from God that neutralizes or counsels out the consequences of sin upon our life. The thought is closely linked to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, where John says that the blood of Christ has cleansed us from all sin. Paul tells us in Romans 3, 25, that God accomplished this purpose of saving us from his wrath by determining that Christ, by the public act, that is Christ's death upon the cross, should become our wrath-removing sacrifice. That is our propitiation. Christ's death is a means of removing the divine wrath of God from a believing sinner. The public demonstration of Christ's sacrificial death upon the cross shows to all the inherent justice of God. Justice lies at the heart of redemption and propitiation is God's provision of grace uh, to justify the believing sinner. Finally, around the throne, John says that there is a rainbow uh, with a dominant color of emerald green. To see a complete rainbow is rare. Often they disappear into the clouds or into the horizon. Uh, the rainbow that John saw was uh, completely encircling the throne. Rainbows have always spoken of God's covenant uh, of mercy to mankind, and the color green is a symbol of eternal life. After Lee surrendered at the end of the American Civil War on the 9th of May, 1865, Abraham Lincoln spoke to a large crowd from the balcony of the White House. At the end of his speech, Senator Harlan asked, what should we do with the rebels? Now the vindictive crowd called out, hang them! Tad, Lincoln's son, then 11 years old, turned to his father and said, no, no, Papa, hang on them. Hang on to them. That's it, Lincoln replied. We will hang on to them. God, through his divine mercy, initiated by the new covenant we have in Christ, has hung on to us by giving us eternal life through Jesus Christ. Praise God for his mercy. <laughs> Green is the most restful color, and this is why God chose it above all other colors for the trees and fields for, for much of his creation. The color green shows us that there is rest in the presence of God from all our daily cares and worries. The psalmist David says in Psalm 23, the Lord God makes us to lie down in green pastures. The color green allows John and all of humanity and all living creatures to look upon the blinding purity and dazzling redemption of God as he sits upon his throne and allows us to worship him in complete rest and assurance of our salvation. Verse 4, around the throne of God there are 24 subordinate thrones occupied by 24 elders. Bible scholars agree that they are a representation of the Old and New Testament, the complete body of believers composed of Jews and Gentiles who come by faith to God, believing in the redemptive work of the Messiah. Bible scholars also state that the number 24 represents the 12 tribes of Israel as described in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles as described in the New Testament. Now these ones are recognized as the redeemed believers for two reasons. First, they are wearing white robes. White robes were worn by Old Testament priests when carrying out their priestly duties. The overcoming believers of the Church of Sardis were promised white robes as, and as stated earlier, earlier Christians wore white robes when being water baptized. Symbolized at the beginning of a new life of purity and victory and the resurrected body which the faithful would receive at the coming of Christ. 
white robes were a sign of righteousness, which the believers at Laodicea was instructed to purchase from Christ to cover their shame and nakedness. Secondly, because they're wearing golden crowns. The word crown here is Stephanos, and it refers to a garland or wreath, which was a victor's crown worn by an athlete. Christ promised the church at Smyrna that in recognition of their faithfulness, a victor's crown would be given to those who remain faithful and loyal to him during such persecution. The church at Philadelphia was also encouraged to hold on to the victor's crown while engaged in the great missionary activity. It's in this description of the 24 elders that we see the promise of Christ fulfilled to the believers. Hallelujah. Verse 5. John's attention is quickly drawn to the throne of God as he hears an awesome display of God's majesty and power. For he says that proceeding from the throne of God is lightnings and thunderings and, and a mighty voice. Before the throne of God there are seven lamps which are described as the seven spirits of God. As stated earlier, this is a representation of the divine majesty of the Holy Spirit. The position of the seven spirits of God before the throne demonstrate an equality and unity of the Holy Spirit with the God the Father. The Athanasian Creed of the church formulated at the Council of Constantinople in AD 381 states that the church believes the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Section B. Praise of Creation, chapter 4, verses 6 to 11. Charles Wesley wrote 6,500 hymns and gospel songs on every conceivable subject. Yet his first hymn, just three days after his conversion, was the still well-known and very wonderful hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Uh, the first verse goes, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, My Great Redeemer's Praise, The Glory of My God and King, The Triumph of His Grace. What a testimony to his salvation. Charles Wesley, like all believers and those before the throne of God in this section, cannot help but lift their voice and sing praise to God for all what he has done. Verses 6 to 8. John tells us that before the throne there is a sea of glass like crystal. Now clear glass in the ancient world was a priceless commodity only owned by the very wealthy. In fact, glass as clear as crystal was as precious as gold. According to tradition, uh, Solomon was so wealthy that he had his palace floor covered in glass, and it looked like water or a mini sea. When Queen Sheba came to visit him, she picked up her skirts, thinking that she had to wade through water. Lightning proceeding from the throne bounces off the sea of glass, creating a, a dazzling brightness uh, that's almost too much for the human eyes to look upon. The sea of glass represents the purity, the pricelessness, and the vastness of God's holiness that separates even the church in her redeemed state from God. Around the throne there are four beasts. Uh, these are not symbols, but actually living creatures. For the Greek word for beast is zoon here, and it means living creatures. The first is like a lion. The second is like an ox. The third is like a man, and the fourth is like an eagle. John also describes them as six-winged creatures whose wings are full of eyes. These beings have been created to give continuous praise and adoration to God. John tells us that these ones do not rest day and or night. Their praise is directed to three particular attributes. First, to God's holiness. For the four beasts cry out, Holy, holy, holy. The words speak of God's absolute purity, perfection and excellence, that separates him from all creation. Jonathan Edwards, the great the theologian and hymn writer of the hymn Amazing Grace said this, Holiness is more than a mere attribute of God. It is the sum of all his attributes. It is the outshining of all that God is. Okay. The second attribute of God to which the four creatures direct their praise is God's omnipotence or power. For they describe God as almighty. The word omnipotence comes from the Latin word meaning all power or unlimited power. The Greek word for almighty is pantak rector, which means unrestricted power exercising absolute dominion. 
It is in the description and the action of the four living creatures we see that nothing lies beyond God's control and absolute dominion. The power of God is seen in the adoration of these four living creatures. One like a lion, the mightiest of all wild animals. One like an ox, the mightiest of all domesticated animals. And one like an eagle, the mightiest of all birds. And, and finally, one like a man, the mightiest of God's creation. All bowing down and worshipping God. All submitting to His authority and dominion. Finally, the creatures praise God for His eternal existence. And they say, who was and is and is to come. The words describe God's holiness and power that stretches from eternity to eternity. Thus the continuous song of worship and praise sung by the four living creatures brings a wonderful assurance to John's readers that nothing lies beyond God's power as he holds eternity in his hands and his holiness will triumph over all evil. Verses 9 to 11, the chapter ends on a crescendo of praise. Every sentence, every word is is calculated to bring praise, glory, and honor to God, alone who is exalted on his throne. In response to the continuous praise of the living creatures, the 24 elders, symbolic of the believers, cast their crowns before God, falling down prostrate before him. In the ancient world, when one king surrendered to another, he would cast his crown at the victor's feet. It was a sign of complete surrender and submission. The 24 elders then sing a beautiful hymn that the Lord is worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. This hymn was especially significant for first century Christians. The phrase, you are worthy, and our Lord and our God are inscriptions reserved for emperor worship. Each time the believers sang this hymn, they took a stand against the false god Caesar and his worship. And they expose their lives to persecution and to death by the confession of such a song. Such a statement was a triumphant confession of faith, an assertion that God holds first place in all the universe. Only God is worthy of all our praise and honor. In the year 1808, a grand performance of the orchestral piece creation based on Genesis chapter 3 and composed by Haydn took place in Vienna. Haydn was present at this performance, but he was so old and feeble that he had to be wheeled in in a wheelchair uh, into the theater uh, where the princess of the house of Esterhar took her seat beside his. Now this was the last time that Haydn appeared in public. And it must have been an impressive sight to see the aged father of music listening to a composition of his younger days, but, not, but now too old to take an active and, and share in the performance. Now the, the presence of the old man aroused an intense enthusiasm amongst the audience until it could be no longer suppressed. As the chorus and the orchestra burst with full power upon the supreme passage of the music in the composition of creation called And There Was Light, the enraptured audience spontaneously rose to their feet and applauded Haydn. Amidst the enraptured audience, the old composer was seen striving to raise himself. And once on his feet, he mustered up all his strength and in reply to the applause of the audience, he cried out as loud as he could, No, not from me, but pointing to heaven, he said, From hence, from heaven above, comes all. He then fell back into his chair, faint and exhausted, and had to be carried from the room. You see, Hayden recognized that all he had created was only possible because of the power of God. So too, the overcoming believers cast their crowns, their rewards of faithfulness before God, realizing that their faithfulness was only made possible by his faithfulness. The chapter ends on a glorious note of assurance for the individual believer and the church when we are told that all things exist by the will of God. The 24 elders sing, For you created all things, and, and by your will they exist. The two words, they exist, assure us that God has not abandoned the world, that he's not abandoned the church. Jesus gave the same promise in Matthew's Gospel 28 verse 20, that he would always be with us even to the end of time. There's a rather touching but stirring story in Scottish history 
which concerns the Highland chief of the noble house of McGregor, who fell wounded at the Battle of Precipice. Seeing their chief fall, the clan began to waver and give the enemy the advantage. The old chieftain, seeing the effects of his wounds upon his clan, raised himself up at his elbow. While blood was gushing with streams from his side, from his wounds, he cried out, I am not dead, my children. I am looking to see that you do your duty. Well, the sound of his voice and the assurance that he was still watching over them revived their sinking courage and aroused them to put forth their mightiest effort and energy to turn the stem of the dreadful tide of the battle that day and to bring victory to the McGregor clan. The church today also stands on a battlefield. We too have a great chieftain, Jesus Christ, who was wounded for our sins. Yet there is a difference. He does not support himself upon his elbows, bleeding from his wounds. No, he's risen from the dead and he's seated victorious at the right hand of the Father. With all principalities and powers under his control. And from this position, his voice thunders out. I am not dead, my children. I'm looking to see that you do your duty. I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Whatever situation we are passing through, his eyes are fixed upon us. His presence revives us, energizes, and stimulates us to carry on. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel 28 verse 20, I am with you always. And in the Greek language, we see that he meant it literally. That he is always there for us. Which means that he is not absent to anyone in any situation. In the Greek language, I am is in a very intense way of referring to oneself. It's comparable to saying, I myself and only I am with you. Not only do we in uncertain times have the support and companionship of human companionship, but also the companionship of the Son of God. The word always in the Greek language expresses the thought of the whole of every day. Just not the horizon of life that's in view, but every day that we live. Whatever the duration of the church's mission upon the earth, our primary joy and strength will be our Lord's presence with us. Section C, the unopened seven-sealed book and the Lamb, chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. Verse 1. The word and at the beginning of the chapter shows us that John is continuing to speak of the vision before the throne of God. John looks upon the throne and the vision is enlarged and there he sees a scroll or a book in the right hand of God. The phrase in the right hand is better translated as lying in the palm of the right hand, giving the distinct impression that the hand is extended in an act of offering it to anyone who is able to open it. Unlike other scrolls, this scroll is written on both sides and sealed along the edge with seven seals. These two things are very significant in the ancient world. Paper or scrolls at that time of John were made of papyrus reed found on the banks of the River Nile. Papyrus sheets were made up of, uh, by placing thin strips of papyrus reeds in two layers at right angles one to another, then joined with glue, Nile water and pressure. Though a papyrus reed grows to about three meters in height, the average width of a papyrus sheet is about 47 centimeters. Papyrus sheets are joined together by vertical papyrus reeds until the required length of the scroll is achieved. Writing was done on the side where the papyrus reeds and fibers ran horizontal and was known as the recto. The other side of the papyrus reeds and fibers that ran vertical were called the verso. And it was not normally used for writing on the vertical side, uh, made it difficult to write horizontally across the page. However, if the spatial message was important, uh, the scribe would often turn the scroll over and write on the back. So a scroll written on both sides represents a very important message. The fullness of the scroll means that God has left nothing out of his plans and his plans are incapable of failure and they are perfect. He is prepared for any unforeseen contingency. The scroll is sealed with seven seals along the edge, signifying an important legal document or diplomatic or military document, which can only be opened by an authorized person or persons. The seven seals on the edge 
uh, bring a realization of the profound secrecy of the contents of the scroll. The vision of such a scroll would have filled John and his readers with the same great sense of anticipation, expectation and excitement as we feel reading this passage. Verses 2 to 3. As John looks upon the scroll, there is a sudden movement in the heavenly host, and a mighty angel steps forward and with a loud, thunderous voice asks who is worthy to break the seal and to open the book. In other words, the one who is right and authority to come forward and make rightful claim to break open the seals, so that we all may know the plans of God for the end times. John and all of heaven wait for someone to step forward. You can imagine John's eyes eagerly scanning the multitude of heavenly hosts and the vast population of the earth looking for someone to step forward. Yet the scriptures tell us that no one in heaven or upon earth dare to accept the challenge or undertake the task. The task is too great for any person or angelic being. No one steps forward for none are worthy. Deep sorrow fills the heart of the apostle John and he begins to weep. He weeps in a place where no tears have fallen. So we see that these were not idle tears or tears of fleeting emotion, but tears of intercession from one who desires to see and to know more of the mind of God. They are tears that desire to see the promise fulfilled in Revelations 4, 1, to see the things that must take place. They are the same tears that the believer weep in intercessory prayers to see the plans of God and the purpose of God fulfilled in his church. And upon earth, as the Lord's Prayer says, your God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Section D, the Lamb is worthy. Chapter 5, verses 5 to 14. Verse 5. As John weeps, he is comforted and greatly encouraged by the words of one of the 24 elders. As a faithful minister of the word, the elder describes the one who is worthy to open the scroll. He speaks of him according to his titles found in scriptures. For he says, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed. The elder first describes this one as the Lion of Judah. In Genesis chapter 49, Jacob prophesied over his son Judah that from his lineage a great ruler would come and he would be like a great lion from whom the scepter of kingship and authority would never be taken and all the people of the world would bow down to him. The Jews understood this to be none other than the promised Messiah. Next, the elder described the one who is worthy as being of the root of David. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 11 of the glorious hope of the royal Messiah, whom he described as coming from the stem of Jesse or the root of the family line of David. The words of the elder brought an up-to-date living hope in the soul of John that Christ the Messiah had prevailed and had conquered all his foes. This same living hope also resides in every believer. Moses, the great leader of Israel, prayed in Deuteronomy 32 that as he spoke that the, of the greatness of God, that his words would refresh, revive the people of Israel like gentle rain and like the early morning dew. The words of the elder fall like dew and gentle rain upon the distressed soul of John. And so it is that the word of God refreshes our souls and points us to truth. The words of the elder in this passage assure all believers at every age that Christ has prevailed. Verses 6 to 7. John looks in the midst of the throne and he sees a lamb as though he'd been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. In the Old Testament, horns were a sign of power. And upon seeing such a vision, John's mind couldn't help but go back to the days of his youth. As a young man, about the age of 16, he, be, he became a disciple of John the Baptist. And one day, while following John the Baptist and his teaching on repentance and the coming Messiah, John saw John the Baptist suddenly stop and seeing Jesus coming, he pointed to Jesus, stating that he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In John chapter 1, verse 29. Immediately upon hearing these words, John left following John the Baptist and became a committed follower to Jesus Christ. Now, why did this statement have such an impact on him at such an age? Well, at that time, the symbol of the Lamb had two meanings. The first meaning, with which we are familiar with, is that it stood for the sacrifice and atonement of sins. The second meaning was a symbol of the Lamb was of a great conqueror. Between the New and Old Testament, the Jews revolted against Roman oppression led by the Maccabees. 
had a symbol of victory and conquest, as all revolutions do, and that symbol was that of a horned lamb. Now, this revolt was crushed by the Romans, but the horned lamb remained the symbol of defiance against Rome. Here in Revelation 5, verse 6, John sees Christ as a lamb, once slain, but not with two horns as Israel's emblem of victory, but with seven horns, symbolizing ultimate power, now alive as a conquering lamb, who through his sacrifice fought one final battle with the powers of darkness, conquering them and setting us free from the power of sin. Again, the unity of the Trinity is emphasized for the Lamb is on the throne having seven spirits of God, which is the Holy Spirit. John says in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The noun word in the Greek is the word logos. And John, by divine direction of the Holy Spirit, identifies the logos as being a separate, equal member of the Godhead who shared eternity with God. He does this by two phrases. The first phrase is with God, which perhaps could be better translated as the word was face to face with God. Meaning that the word is a distinct person who existed from all eternity in the closest possible fellowship with God. The second phrase, was God, which was linked with the phrase with God, shows that Jesus is not the entire Godhead, yet the divinity that belonged to the rest of the Godhead also belongs equally to him. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 16, Jesus affirms the equality of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. Uh, when he said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper or comforter that he may abide with you forever. Jesus said another comforter. Now in the Greek language there are two words for another. All us meaning another of the same kind and hetros meaning another of a different kind. The Greek word used in John 14 verse 16 is all us meaning another of the same kind. The Holy Spirit is the same kind as Jesus and the Father. Thus we have the Athanasian Creed of the Church formulated uh, at Constantinople in 381 AD, stating that the Church believes the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit is are all one, uh, the glory equal and the majesty co-eternal. Jesus then takes the book, thus expressing the perfect harmony between the will of Christ and the will of the God the Father. Jesus stated in John 6, 38, that he came from heaven not to do his will, but the will of the Father. Verse 8. No sooner has Christ received the book out of the right hand of God than all of creation in heaven break forth in praise and worship to him. And the four beasts and the twenty-four elders fall down prostrate before Christ in adoration and worship. Each of the elders falls down before Christ in worship. Each of the elders have a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now on earth, the prayers of the saints are often scoffed at, ridiculed, and counted as worthless, a waste of time by the unbeliever. Yet in heaven, they are counted as being of great value. They are kept in golden bowls and brought into the very presence of God. Sir Thomas Baxton said, you know the value of prayer? It is precious beyond all price. Never, never neglect it. Verses 9 to 10. These verses are often referred to as the elders' hymn of redemption. The elders begin by singing that Christ is worthy. On March 21, 1969, a U.S. Marine patrol in Vietnam descended a steep bank to fill their canteens with water. And as they stood in 60 centimeters of water, the area suddenly exploded with gunfire and grenades. Several men were hit. And according to the official report, one soldier, without, with complete disregard for his own safety, assisted several Marines. Despite heavy fire, he made several trips until himself was wounded and unable to continue. 21 years later, one of the men who had been pulled out of the water learned that his rescuer was still alive. So he set out to see if he was recognized for his heroism. Noreen found his rescuer, John Lara, who was paralyzed from his waist down. 
and with a heart full of appreciation, he finally saw that Jim received a much-deserved bronze star. We cannot help but be deeply moved by the Marine's desire to honour the one who had saved his life. How much more deeply we who have experienced our salvation feel towards the one who has paid a far greater price to save our souls. No one deserves the honour that is Christ. Man may be worthy of ad admiration, but only Christ is worthy of adoration. No one has sacrificed so much for so many. No wonder all of heaven will praise him forever and ever. The choir sings that Christ is worthy because out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, he has redeemed us to God. Rita Snowden wrote a book in 1937 titled, If I Open My Door. And in it, she describes a congregation that was planning to build a new place of worship. Central to the sanctuary was a stained glass window depicting children worshipping Jesus. Now the congregation hired an artist to paint a picture of the proposed window. He fulfilled his assignment and that night he dreamed that he heard a noise in his studio. Going to investigate, he saw a stranger altering the picture. He cried out, stop, stop, you'll ruin it. But the stranger answered, you've already ruined it. The intruder then explained that the children's faces had been all one colour and he was using many colours. When the intruder said that he wanted the children of all nations and races to come to him, the artist realised that he was talking to Jesus himself. The Song of the Redeemed extends to the entire world. It anticipates the fulfilment of the Great Commission. God's message of salvation and eternal life is not limited uh, to one specific culture, race or country. Every tribe, nation and people are called to participate. The power of the blood can redeem any person, anywhere at any time. Jesus went to the cross to bring salvation to people of every nation. The choir continues in verse 10 to sing that Christ is worthy of honour because he has made the believers kings and priests and we shall reign on earth. The word made carries the idea of a trainer jabbing his finger into the chest of a heavyweight boxing champion and say to, saying this, if it weren't for me, you would be nobody. I made you. You know, if it wasn't for Christ, we would be nothing. He has made us. He is the one who has redeemed us. Though this verse is obviously speaking of a future experience of the believer and is built upon the present reality and what we already been said in the previous verse. Firstly, the choir sings that we are kings. This speaks of a royal ancestry that we have inherited by right of adoption. On the 27th of December 2012, the Russian President Putin signed a bill that banned Americans from adopting Russian orphans. The Russian bill was in retaliation for the American law that calls for sanctions against Russian officials deemed to be human rights violators. UNICEF in 2014 estimated there were about 700,000 children in Russia who had not been in parental custody, while only 18,000 Russians were now waiting to adopt a child. You can imagine the heartache of those children who were intended for adoption, hearing that the door of adoption and life of love and care had been slammed shut because of political tension between two superpowers. Praise God that this is not the case for the advancement of the gospel. The fulfillment of the Great Commission has not come to an end. The door of adoption in the kingdom of God has not closed. Paul writing in Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 to 5 tells us that God has sent his son to redeem us so that we might be received through adoption as sons and daughters of God. In spite of the fact of us being spiritually separated from Christ without hope, alienated and strangers to the covenant, unable to qualify for spiritual citizenship as stated in Ephesians, the door of adoption is wide open. God's message of salvation and eternal life is being proclaimed to all. It's not limited to a specific culture, race or country. John writing in John 1 verse 12 tells us that those who receive Christ as Saviour and believe in His name are given the right to become the children of God. Praise God. The choir continues to sing that the believers have been made priests. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 speaks of the royal priesthood of believers. Royal priests refer not just to ordinary priests but priests who 
are the personal priests of the king. The word royal is an interesting word in the Greek, uh, a noun meaning a palace, a king's court. It also means a royal residence, a king's house or a kingly community or a king's family. Thus, Peter's thoughts are that we as Christians share in Christ's kingship as well as his priesthood. The Old Testament priests had privileges and rights which no other had. They had the right and privilege of entering into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God. Through Christ, that privilege, that right, once only experienced by a few, is now available to all those who come by faith, accepting the work of Calvary and the grace found in Jesus Christ. Though we experience a wonderful fellowship with God now, there is a time coming for the saint in the new heaven and new earth when our communion with God will surpass all our expectations and imagination. What a wonderful Savior we have. Verse 11 and 12. After the praise of the elders, the living creatures, we have the praise of an innumerable throng of angels praising Christ with one voice, that he is worthy to receive praise. The sevenfold aspiration of praise is called an antiphonum to the eldest hymn to the previous verses. Now the word antiphonum comes from two Greek words. Uh, they are anti, meaning opposite, and iphone, which means voice. In Christian music, it is a responsive style of singing. Antiphonal music is music that is performed by two separate independent choirs singing in interaction often singing alternate musical phrases. Now, according to the historian Socrates of Constantinople, antiphonal music was introduced into Christian worship by Ignatius of Antioch in 107 AD, which was about 12 years after the book of Revelation was written. Now, this style of music was very popular in local churches in the late Renaissance and early Baroque period. The scene that John is describing is a typical Sunday morning service for a local congregation of the Renaissance and early Baroque period, except on a much grander scale. Now, the sevenfold aspirations of praise. Firstly, Jesus is worthy to receive power. The Greek word here is doumenos, and it refers to miraculous power. In the context, it refers to the inherent right of Jesus as a member of the Godhead to do what is his will and to hinder what is not his will. This is expressed in the words of our Lord in Matthew's Gospel 28 verse 18 when he states, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Secondly, Jesus is worthy to receive riches which in the Greek expresses absolute abundance of external possessions. Here the word is used in a specific sense, referring to the fullness of the things pertaining to salvation with which Christ is able to enrich others. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul describes those spiritual blessings from God as the unsearchable riches of Christ, which he and the church have commissioned to preach. The word unsearchable describes a resource that can never be emptied or measured like a great unfathomable sea. Thirdly, Christ is worthy to receive wisdom, which in the Greek is Sophia. Paul in Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 states, that, states concerning Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. For centuries, the Saxon princesses gathered their gems and treasures in a green vault in a museum in Dresden, Germany. Amongst these treasures is a rather large silver egg presented by a Saxon queen. And when you touch a little spring, it opens up and reveals an egg yolk made of pure gold. Now within the yolk is a chicken. Press the wing and the chicken flies open disclosing a splendid golden crown studded with jewels. But that's not all. Touch another secret spring and you will find hidden in the center a magnificent diamond ring. So it is with those who know Jesus Christ. Just when we think we've discovered all the treasures of Christ and there is no more to discover in a moment of crisis or a moment of quiet solitude, we reach out and touch him. And another magnificent treasure of his grace and personality is revealed to us. Fourthly, Jesus is worthy to receive strength, 
which in the Greek is closely related to the word power and may be, may be translated as the word might or capacity. We find in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, that Christ is the strength of all believers. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Fifthly, Jesus is worthy to receive honor, which in the Greek means to value or to esteem highly. To honor one is who outranks others, having preeminence in all things. Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, speaks of Christ having preeminence. The word preeminence in the Greek, which means first in rank or influence, or fo foremost in time or importance. A woman was taking a class in photography. And for one of her assignments, she chose her six-year-old daughter as the subject and asked her to sit next to a beautiful hillside. Close to where she sat, there was an apple tree in full blossom. The woman just couldn't resist. She gave the tree a prominent place in the picture. The woman was surprised when her instructor pointed out the problem with the photo. The apple tree distracts from your primary purpose, the little girl. See how it catches your eye? The instructor asked. It's so easy to get distracted by the apple blossoms of life. Those things that don't last. Let us focus our camera of life on the true subject who completes the picture of life, Jesus Christ, who has preeminence in all things. Sixthly, Jesus is to receive glory, which means to evoke good opinion. That is to recognize something of inherent intrinsic worth. When used here, it means that the 24 elders recognize the inherent intrinsic worth of the kingly majesty of Christ as the Messiah and his absolute perfection of deity. Finally, Jesus is worthy to receive blessing, which in the Greek means to speak well of someone. To bless God is to express a heart full of love and gratitude for who he is and what he's done in our lives. The psalmist David says these words in Psalm 103 verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. How can mortal words express due adoration to such a great Lord and Savior? Our eloquent whispers or our shouts fail to express the praise and glory due to his name. For he who has done great things. Verses 13 and 14. The worship of the Lamb now reaches an amazing crescendo of praise. The vision before us is all-inclusive, with all of creation lifting its voice in praise, giving Christ blessing, glory, and power. The vision draws us into the sea. We cannot help but feel our spirits lifted, our souls captivated by the rapture of the scene, and spontaneously lifting our voices with, with all creation, giving praise, honor, and glory to the Lamb who is worthy to open the book. So the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is worthy to open the book because he's opened a way of salvation for people. His will is in complete harmony with God the Father. He has redeemed us from every tribe and nation. He provides the answer to our hopeless despair and those who have experienced his redemption will lift their voice to him in resounding praise. He is worthy to open the book because he, through his death and resurrection, has opened the door of adoption for us so that we might be made kings and priests, sharing in the inheritance and the privileges of the saints. Let us lift our voice in praise and thanksgiving, singing, Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah.